So it's a great pleasure to have Professor Rajesh Gopakumar, who is the director of uh, uh, International Center for Theoretical Sciences, which is the part of Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in Bangalore. He previously uh, was in Harish Chandra Research Institute, Allahabad. His expertise area is string theory. Uh, all of us know that what the uh, works of Rajesh and why he's uh, known to the research community. I will not talk about that, but today he will give us uh, a uh, overview on uh, string theory, why this is important. And uh, Rajesh, please, uh, you can start. And uh, before starting, I just uh, want to thank you from uh, bottom of our heart that you have agreed to give this talk. So you are the 36th speaker of this series and we all welcome you from Potsdam. Uh, thank you, uh, Shantan. Uh, let me uh, uh, share my screen and uh, hopefully, yes. Okay. Um, yeah, it, it, it's very nice to be able to participate in this uh, virtual seminar uh, that uh, you are organizing at Potsdam. Uh, I think uh, right now that has now become a new feature, but it has, I think, brought people closer together. So uh, it, it is a welcome development uh, amidst the uh, bigger tragedy that has uh, uh, happened across the world. But um, uh, so when Shantan wrote to me, uh, I, I had the impression and uh, 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 that it was uh, to be aimed at a, a general, um, a fairly um, a colloquium level kind of a talk. So, uh, so, I, so what I have uh, chosen to uh, talk about is, uh, is something, uh, some aspects of string theory and in particular uh, uh, holography, um, which uh, I think can be viewed as down to earth string theory and I will uh, try to explain the title of this uh, uh, little bit provocative title. Uh, uh, but uh, I have tried to aim it at a broad audience of theoretical physicists uh, who uh, who uh, who have uh, maybe not that much of uh, familiarity with uh, recent developments in string theory, and especially for young students who are trying to uh, to get a picture of the uh, the developments that are happening in areas of string theory. Um, so, uh, as Shantan said, please feel free to interrupt me uh, throughout. Uh, any time uh, this it will make it better if it is uh, more interactive uh, i must apologize to the experts that most of this will be fairly elementary and uh, basic uh, background material for most of you uh, but uh, definitely for the students if there are questions and other things that you want to uh, ask in the middle uh, please uh, don't hesitate so okay so now let me uh, uh, let me try to oops uh, yeah L uh, let me try to explain the title a little bit uh, so uh, you all know you all have seen this uh, picture of the uh, phase diagram of a liquid uh, vapor and the gas and solid um, phase diagram. We all study it in our uh, thermodynamics uh, courses uh, and. Um, uh, so in this phase diagram, uh, uh, you, uh, I hope you can see my cursor. Um, in this phase diagram, the, uh, uh, there is this very special point uh, called the critical point, uh, which is an archetype of a second order phase transition, because we all know that this sort of uh, vaporizing, uh, vaporization curve, uh, which separates the liquid and um, uh, gaseous phases, um, there is uh, that usually is a first order transition, uh, phase transition with a, a latent heat. But as you um, increase uh, the temperature, uh, 
uh, there's a critical temperature TC uh, at which uh, the um, phase transition becomes a second order one, the latent heat uh, goes to zero. And beyond that, actually, there's no real uh, distinction uh, between the two phases. Uh, so this critical point over here uh, is, uh, is a, uh, is a archetype of a second order phase transition. And um, uh, something that was very surprising was uh, observed many years ago uh, that uh, this has a very, uh, the, at this critical point, uh, it exhibits a very novel scaling behavior. Uh, so in particular, if you uh, look at two quantities, uh, which I will just mm, uh, explain in a moment, uh, one is uh, psi uh, or the correlation length uh, so the correlation length is um, a measure of uh, the fluctuations, the statistical fluctuations, thermal fluctuations in the uh, in this um, uh, system. So, for instance, if I were to look at the density fluctuations uh, um, uh, near uh, the two-point function, measuring the density uh, fluctuations at point X and the point Y, uh, normally away from TC, uh, there would be uh, uh, these uh, fluctuations, this two-point function would die off exponentially with a length scale set by this correlation length psi. Uh, and um, uh, the claim is, the, the novel claim is that uh, this uh, correlation length exhibits a certain scaling behavior as you approach the critical temperature. So for it, to, as T goes to TC, um, this um, uh, correlation length diverges with a very specific exponent called mu, uh, which is one of the so-called critical exponents. Uh, and uh, in particular, as T goes to TC, uh, mu is typically positive, so this will diverge and go to infinity. Um, so at the critical temperature itself, uh, the correlation length no longer dies off exponentially because, the uh, because uh, of uh, the fact that the, um, uh, the correlation doesn't die off exponentially because the correlation length has uh, gone to infinity. In fact, it no and now becomes a power law uh, uh, dependence and that's what uh, this G of X is uh, uh, measuring that power law uh, G of X you can think of as the two-point function uh, and uh, it has now at the critical temperature uh, again a scaling behavior uh, meaning it scales with the separation in a power law whose exponent is given uh, if you appropriately define it um, this, this D is the spatial of the system in this case we are talking about a dimensional liquid vapor uh, system. So, um, so if you choose to normalize the, uh, the exponent in this particular way, there is this uh, quantity eta, which tells you, which captures this, mm, the power law dependence in the uh, Green's function. And um, uh, the remarkable thing that people realized was that this this kind of scaling behavior, these, uh, this uh, divergence of the correlation length and the power law fall off at the critical point, et cetera, is very universal behavior. So in fact, there's a large, not only is it independent of um, mostly the material or the particular liquid and vapor, so this applies to, could apply to water or to alcohol or, uh, and so on, but um, uh, it, uh, uh, it also applies to a large class of other uh, statistical mechanical systems. Um, uh, and I've written down some uh, examples over here. It doesn't really matter. The names are not so important. Uh, the, what is important is that there's a universality class of systems which obey the same behavior, in fact, with the same critical exponents, nu and eta. Uh, and these are captured, in fact, by a very simple model, one of the first ones you learn when you do statistical mechanics, uh, which is the Ising model. In this particular case, for a three-dimensional uh, system, they are captured by a 3D Ising model. Uh, if D was two, then uh, there would be similar uh, systems. Uh, there would be oh, other uh, systems. Uh, Rajesh, I have a question. Sorry for this. Sure. Uh, 
yeah so uh, as far as we know that 3d ising model is not exactly solvable yeah. uh, so uh, so this critical behavior people have found through simulations and all i will come to it later but uh, more in detail but let me just say that um, uh, firstly you can argue on very general grounds that it must be captured by the 3d as in model okay. and uh, i will say something about that later but um, uh, independent of whether you can solve that or not but it is okay. in a sense uh, all the models in this class uh, can be kind of mapped on to uh, the 3d as in model at its critical point uh, um, uh, so uh, now people, of course, invested therefore a lot of uh, effort into trying to understand uh, the 3D Ising model. Recall that you don't need to solve the 3D Ising model for all values of the temperature, only at the critical point uh, um, uh, where the phase transition happens. So in the 2D Ising model, you remember that there is a critical temperature. Yes. Uh, and uh, of course, there on Saga had a solution for the Ising model at all temperatures. But you can therefore, in particular, take the uh, uh, critical, look at the critical point and uh, extract these exponents there. But in the 3D Ising model, you don't have a solution, but you can still try to extract the information at the critical point through a simulations and uh, um, uh, that's how in fact a lot of information uh, until very recently was mo mostly obtained um, b there was something called the epsilon expansion which i will yes. talk about yes. later uh, which yes. was very successful it has been very successful also uh, which was an approximation method for an analytic approximation method for arriving at uh, estimates of these uh, critical exponents in the 3D ISM model. And thirdly, we will talk about this more about the so-called conformal bootstrap uh, idea, which uh, recently has probably given the best determinations of the 3D ISM model's critical exponents. Uh, so yeah, that's sort of the short answer at the moment. Uh, Thank you for the clarification. Okay. so. Uh, so this idea of this universality classes is a very uh, deep idea and a very remarkable one. In fact, it came about through uh, a lot of interactions between physicists and even chemists. In fact, some of the early works on these critical exponents were by people uh, in chemistry departments. Um, and uh, this is a table which is probably by now a little dated, but it is. Uh, it's, it was there in a concise form. And I just uh, uh, took it from this Chaikin and Lubensky's uh, classic textbook, Principles of Condensed Matter Physics. Uh, so, uh, so in this, uh, you can see um, that um, uh, uh, have listed about uh, five critical exponents. Uh, this new and eta were the ones that I uh, 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 showed you earlier. This coherence length uh, xi, and uh, uh, this is the same correlation function but expressed in momentum space uh, now. And you can see the exponent eta over there. And this was a little t is the deviation from. Uh, TC, uh, so what I call T minus TC in my previous slide. There are other things like the susceptibility, the order parameters, specific heat, etc., all coming with their own critical exponents. Now there was an approach that uh, people naively took to try to understand these uh, exponents, which gave uh, certain values. And uh, and uh, Landau and Ginsberg were the people I think who most. Uh, clearly articulated this so-called mean field approach. And uh, this gives certain values for these critical exponents. Uh, but if you actually compare them with experiments, uh, this is what the last line is. So uh, let me just explain a little bit the notation. Uh, three dimensions, of course, refers to three uh, the spatial dimensions. So there are two, uh, two rows here of 3D and one for 2D. Uh, and a little n refers to sort of a symmetric class. Uh, for many of you, uh, it's easy to understand what this is, and I'll say more about it later. Uh, this is uh, the symmetry. Uh, under there's it's a certain internal symmetry uh, o, an o n symmetry um, so n equal to one is sort of a trivial case but uh, n equal to three is then o three symmetry which you have for 
uh, for a ferromagnet or antiferromagnet, uh, which is pointing, which is pointing in uh, um, um, many directions. You can have n equal to two, which is an O2 model, like the XY model. And there's a, n equal to one is essentially like Z2N. That's why the Eisen model comes in. Uh, so, uh, so that's this uh, nomenclature here of n equal to one, etc. Uh, so the experiments you can see are not the, uh, the experimental values, and probably these have gotten better now. Um, are quite far from the mean field uh, values. Uh, in general. So mean field doesn't seem like such a great uh, 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 description of uh, the actual numerical values of these uh, critical exponents. But uh, the theory, and in this case, I think uh, this was mainly from the epsilon expansion and so on, which I will talk about a little later, uh, uh, ended up giving um, uh, values which are fairly close. So you can see the n equal to 1. So uh, they have only a column uh, the results here for the theory in 3D. Uh, so you can compare the n equal to 1 here with the 3D n equal to 1 here. And you can see they're fairly uh, within bar error bars. Uh, um, and then n equal to 3 k's also, uh, you, can, uh, you can sort of uh, see they are, uh, they, are, they are fairly good if you compare it with uh, uh, the second line, uh, the middle line over here. Uh, so, uh, so as it says, the theory suggests that the class, that is the set of exponents, uh, depends only on the spatial dimensionality and the symmetry, that's this n. So the, the dimension d in the symmetry class n, uh, and of course the nature of the interactions, but uh, whether it's uh, short range interactions or not. And typically all the models here are described, all this phenomena uh, uh, here. Uh, uh, and you can see there's quite a lot of them, liquid gas, binary fluid, ferromagnetic, antiferromagnetic transitions, etc. cetera. Uh, so all these uh, have short range interactions and, uh, and, and these exponents don't depend on the detailed form or strength of the interaction. So there could be many materials in each of these categories, there would be many liquid gases, binary fluids, ferromagnetic, antiferromagnetic transitions, but these exponents are universal. So that's something quite remarkable. And people in the 50s and 60s found it something very striking. And it is even now when you first learn of it, it is something uh, rather remarkable. So people wanted to understand uh, where does this universality really come from and uh, why, uh, how do you even uh, try, uh, try to extract out these exponents uh, from uh, theory. Uh, and the deepest insights came from Wilson, uh, where, uh, who's uh, to understand the problems came up with the insight of the renormalization group, or rather developed the insights of the renormalization group into uh, something very fundamental, and realized that it's in the heart of quantum field theory, that uh, this phenomenon, in a sense, uh, really points to what is uh, really at the heart of quantum field theory. And for younger people, I just want to say this as a very instructive example in the history of science in some ways because quantum field theory, as you all know, originated from trying to understand particles and electro quantum electrodynamics and then uh, the weak interactions and the strong interactions uh, and so on, so forth later. So whenever you study a quantum field theory book, it's mostly kind of uh, infused with the thinking of high energy physics and particle physics, etc. But actually, quantum field theory is a very broad framework. And it is in the context of understanding questions like these, which are actually originating from statistical physics. In fact, classical statistical physics, as I will just emphasize in a moment, uh, that one got some of the deepest insights into the real nature of quantum field theory and the renormalization group uh, phenomenon, uh, the renormalization group idea, to which sort of tells you what quantum field theory uh, is in some deep sense. So this is important to, uh, to take away because uh, insights 
can come from everywhere. So it's very important as a theoretical physicist to be sort of open to uh, insights coming in from diverse areas of physics. And that's one of the rich aspects and exciting aspects of physics that you, uh, uh, you have this uh, interconnectivity of ideas. And, and the particular um, uh, insight over here is something, again, very uh, striking because uh, uh, you grow up, I mean, you learn quantum field theory as a, mm, a scheme for describing quantum fluctuations of a continuum system, like I said, an electromagnetic system and so on. Uh, but uh, the point is that the formalism of quantum field theory is the technique or even just the, uh, the way uh, the, the whole formulation um, uh, uh, applies equally well to statistical fluctuations or thermal fluctuations uh, 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 as well as to quantum fluctuations. And, and this is because of this remarkable sort of uh, relation uh, and that if you view a quantum field a quantum field theory as capturing uh, quantum fluctuations by means of by weighting all the different field configurations by this Feynman weight e to the i h uh, e to the i over h bar uh, times the classical action and you integrate over all the field configurations this is very mathematically very close to uh, um, uh, it is a probabilistic description. Uh, that's why you have fluctuations, uh, uh, quantum fluctuations here, which are set by H bar. But these are this is mathematically almost identical to uh, the description in terms of what you learn in statistical mechanics, thanks to Boltzmann and others, and that you uh, describe a statistical system in the canonical ensemble. Uh, by um, by a probability distribution of this kind, where H is a Hamiltonian, and especially if you are describing a continuum system, then you have continuum fields uh, phi, and you have a Hamiltonian or a energy density uh, uh, that you integrate over uh, all of space uh, and gives you the total energy. Um, that's what this is, and you weighted by this factor e to the minus beta times the energy and beta is the inverse temperature and you sum of all such configurations. So these two look remarkably close to each other. Uh, and uh, the, the main, um, uh, this thing is that uh, beta and uh, H bar sort of play very similar roles. Uh, there is of course a very important factor of I over here, which of course uh, leads to many which you have to be very careful about and which you have to deal with in appropriate ways. But uh, there is, uh, by now, people understand reasonably well how you sort of do this analytic continuation. And, and in fact, in quantum field theory, even before uh, this, uh, as a connection to physics, uh, people had uh, realized that there's a so-called Euclidean formulation of quantum field theory which makes it even closer to this. And there is a appropriate way in which you analytically continue things from uh, Lorentzian signature to Euclidean. Uh, so, so, but the main point I want to, you to take away in case you have not seen this before is that beta, which is the inverse temperature, uh, plays the role of one over H bar. So in a sense, H bar and T and the temperature are kind of uh, thermal fluctuations and quantum fluctuations and uh, at some level play a very similar role. Now, uh, so this is of course general and I and uh, many people were of course aware of this connection. Um, so Rajesh, yes. uh, here beta can be treated as a kind of a thermal circle like you can integrate over time yeah, if you were to write it uh, fully, uh, I mean, uh, so, but uh, uh, you can think of it in, in that way. Uh, if you want to, uh, if you want to uh, make it, make the connection to the theory uh, uh, closer. Uh, but I, here I actually, uh, uh, so there are two, maybe, okay, maybe you might mean something slightly different. You can think of quantum field theory at finite temperature. Uh, which is uh, that, that's when it you uh, 
uh, when you uh, think of, you can think instead of the time direction, you can think of a, a circle which is uh, of radius beta. Uh, uh, so there you still have a one over h bar. You're thinking of a quantum fluctuations in a theory which also has a temperature. So there are both Oh. Term and quantum fluctuations. Uh, but here I'm saying something perhaps more elementary, which is that um, uh, you can look at a classical statistical physics uh, system. So like a three-dimensional statistical physics system describing a uh, liquid vapor transition at its critical point. Uh, this can be described in the, lang at the, in the continuum limit, in near the phase transition, it can be well described by a, a energy functional, which is a three-dimensional functional. So mathematically, it is like a three-dimensional quantum field theory uh, yes. uh, with, uh, with, uh, uh, with beta playing the same role as one over h bar. Uh, so that's uh, the sense. Uh, so here, beta, you should think of uh, this as a uh, so this is the relation between a d-dimensional statistical physics system and a d-dimensional quantum field theory. Uh, so d and it's a, uh, it's just a spatial uh, the spatial path when you're looking at the statistical fluctuations. Uh, you're looking at the equilibrium statistical mechanics. Okay. So. Um, so the uh, dependence of the, uh, so what Wilson really realized was that you should be thinking of, um, uh, and so he, he realized that you could try to view the, uh, the statistical fluctuations in the language of quantum field theory. And people had been studying in quantum field theory, the dependence on scale, uh, on the length scales or uh, energy scales at which you measure things, at which you are describing phenomena. Uh, and he realized that the dependence of the quantum field theory on scale is captured by a dynamical renormalization group flow. Uh, so dynamical in the sense that it can be described by a so-called dynamical system, uh, which I will just show you uh, a little bit, a uh, kind of a pictorial version of it. But this dynamical flow is in the space of couplings or parameters of the theory. Uh, and uh, the critical points of this flow, uh, of this dynamical system, uh, the critical points are the fixed points of this renormalization group flow. Uh, uh, so the um, uh, critical points of the statistical mechanical system uh, can be uh, viewed as fixed points of this renormalization group flow of the quantum field theory and the critical exponents themselves are determined by this fixed point by the sort of the behavior in the uh, immediate vicinity of this fixed point so let me say a little, little bit about case something people are not very familiar with i mean at least give a very uh, cartoonish picture of them and if people have questions i'm happy to elaborate more um, so our modern understanding of quantum field theory uh, really places fixed points in a very central role in, uh, in that because um, uh, for multiple reasons as I will elaborate, but in a way you, you could say that uh, quantum field theory is uh, the study of the fixed points of a renormalization group flow and um, and uh, and uh, the behavior in the vicinity of these fixed points, because in some sense that governs all the rest. Um, they kind of these fixed points kind of are like these basins of attraction in any dynamical system, and they essentially control the behavior uh, uh, of the whole system in other area regions of parameter space as well. So. Uh, so many of you probably have studied dynamical systems in your courses in classical mechanics or mathematical physics and so on. Uh, and, and they are typically described by like a, a first order differential equation or on a space of some uh, and dynamical variables. Um, and um, uh, and uh, you can look at the trajectories under this 
uh, flow in time, so to say, uh, if the dynamical system is a first order differential equation, a set of first order differential equations in, uh, in some time variable, uh, then you can look at the trajectories under this flow and uh, you, uh, you have in particular the so-called fixed points, which are where if, in, uh, if the parameters uh, or the variables of your dynamical system, if they take that, uh, those um, particular values, then they are, th those are fixed under the flow. So, uh, so typically you have a set of equations of the form dxi by dt is equal to some beta i of all the x's. So beta i are some functions of all the variables x size, and there can be n such equations, x1, x2, xn. Uh, so this is a general set of, uh, this is a general dynamical system. And um, uh, here I've drawn sort of a picture of uh, uh, two, uh, say, two variables and uh, some, uh, some dynamical flow which has some set of uh, fixed points. Now these fixed points are characterized by whether they are stable or unstable, et cetera, and the kind of instabilities they can have. Um, so a stable fixed point is one in which if you are anywhere a little bit in the, if you are a little bit off that fixed point, uh, when you start flowing, it will sort of go towards that uh, fixed point. Things are kind of uh, attracted towards it. Uh, unstable ones can be such that there can be some directions along which the flow will, uh, if you put up yourself a little bit from that fixed point, you might end up back there. But generically, there are directions which will take you away from that fixed point. And therefore, if you are at some uh, generic point here, uh, you are not going to end up at the fixed point. You'll sort of go away to some, depending on where you are, to some other fixed points. So, so the, this is uh, this the sort of thing you've probably seen before in, in the context of simple classical mechanical systems. Uh, but it's a very general idea, and uh, uh, and the point is that, as I said in my previous uh, um, uh, previous transparency, uh, the um, dependence on the uh, dependence in a quantum field theory on the scale uh, is what is captured by a dynamical system and and the and the variables are now the couplings of your quantum field theory so like in, in uh, electrodynamics you have the the fine structure constant uh, uh, and in the weak interactions you have a similar uh, um, coupling constant uh, or in condensed matter systems uh, uh, like in the uh, ising model itself there will be nearest neighbor couplings etc so there's always a space of couplings and parameters, and uh, the um, uh, in uh, the insight of uh, Wilson really was that you should think of uh, the quantum field trees at any given scale uh, as being defined in terms of uh, um, uh, an underlying Lagrangian or a Hamiltonian uh, with couplings that are scale dependent. And that scale dependence of that coupling is captured by a dynamical renormalization group flow in terms of the so-called beta functions of the, uh, of the theory. And the critical points are the zeros of those beta functions, uh, uh, or the equivalently the fixed points of the RG flow. Uh, and, uh, and as I uh, said, the critical exponents are, um, uh, are uh, determined by looking at the behavior in the vicinity of these fixed points. So all you need to know for understanding the critical phenomena is to understand the quantum field theory in the infinitesimal vicinity of these fixed points. Uh, both stable and unstable fixed points play a role uh, in our, uh, so all the, you need to have a global picture of the, uh, uh, of the renormalization group flow. Now, um, what people realize, uh, what I think was realized even before Wilson, but people, uh, I think this was, this came more to the front, uh, uh, thanks to the work of Wilson and others, uh, that the fixed point theories, uh, firstly have a scale invariance, 
but in fact they have even more what is called conformal invariance which is uh, basically the group of all the transformations that preserve angles between uh, lines, uh, between straight lines. Um, uh, so, uh, or uh, so if I have two curves that intersect, a conformal transformation will preserve the angle uh, of intersection of the two curves. Uh, so, uh, so you can. Uh, so they are a larger group of transformations than just your rotational uh, symmetry. So, uh, so you might have a system like the 3D Ising model or the water gas transition, in which, of course, you may have rotational symmetry uh, under uh, the um, usual three-dimensional rotations, uh, but you have actually more at the critical point uh, that the uh, that um, uh, things are firstly scale invariant. So in other words, quantities, and this explains the kind of formulas I wrote down at the beginning, namely that the uh, correlators have sort of power law dependence. So if I scale T minus TC by some, uh, by some factor, if I scale all the temperatures by some factor, the, mm, that won't affect the exponent, the, uh, all the uh, quantities like this coherence length or the Green's functions, they will be covariant under this. They will they will transform with an appropriate scaling factor. Um, um, and more uh, is actually true that they are conformally invariant, as I said, which is a larger set of transformations uh, in uh, in uh, three spatial. Uh, uh, dimensions. Uh, uh, this would be the transformation SO4, comma uh, one in four spatial dimensions. It would have been SO4, uh, SO5, comma uh, one, etc. So uh, they, uh, they are non-compact groups, but and they're bigger than the rotation uh, uh, the Poincaré group. Uh, mm -hmm. So there is more symmetry. Uh, so the critical points uh, in the renormalization group flow are. Um, are very special uh, in that they are believed to be conformally invariant. I must uh, I must say that there's no complete proof as of now uh, that um, they are uh, always conformally invariant. Though there are many uh, partial proofs, and there's a good deal of uh, reason to believe that at least in most physical systems of the kind uh, one in, uh, typically encounters, you will tip, you will not just have scale invariance, but also have conformal invariance. And this, at, uh, the presence of this conformal invariance is very critical because you have now much more symmetry and so you, it buys you much more. Uh, and uh, uh, some of you I, uh, I know are from a cosmology background. Uh, and in fact, this was one of the things that uh, has recently been, uh, I think, uh, investigated because uh, people always talk about the scale invariant power spectrum in uh, cosmology, uh, but I think it was uh, uh, some years ago and, uh, and many others, I think, uh, started investigating the consequences of having not just scale invariance, but conformal invariance, uh, uh, because actually the kind of visitor like space times in which you compute. Um, the uh, scale invariant spectrum also have this larger symmetry uh, analog of this. In fact, it's a kind of a Euclidean version of this conformal uh, invariance. Uh, and uh, so there's more symmetry. And whenever you have more symmetry, that constrains things much more. And in particular, correlation functions and so on uh, are actually much more constrained. So, uh, but coming back to um, the uh, the problem we were looking at, uh, the uh, critical point of the 3D Ising model universality class, that whole universality class uh, um, is governed by a very special fixed point. Like I said earlier, uh, you don't really need to know the full solution of the Ising model and so on. All you are interested in is trying to understand whether you can identify the nature of that fixed point uh, of that universality class, this 3D Ising model class. And now that uh, fixed point has a very special name because it was investigated extensively by Wilson and uh, Fisher. Um, this is uh, Michael Fisher, who's 
the father of uh, two other very well-known uh, Fishers, Daniel Fisher and Matthew Fisher. Um, but um, um, the my, uh, Wilson Fisher fixed point is uh, uh, is a very one of the uh, first studied non-trivial fixed points. So there's a whole class of fixed points which are called trivial fixed points or Gaussian fixed points. Uh, um, uh, uh, so those are the fixed points that are always present typically in any free theory. Uh, uh, so a free massless theory um, uh, all has is a trivial example of a fixed point because under renormalized uh, under renormalization group uh, flow uh, nothing evolves a free theory remains a free theory or in the wilsonian language of integrating out uh, fields when you integrate out things in a free theory you get back a free theory and there's just some trivial rescalings uh, of uh, quantities. So it, it is a, uh, so the, there are no parameters that sort of uh, are there, which, um, uh, so if you wish, it's uh, the origin in some sense of the space of parameters and um, it's a trivial fixed point. Uh, uh, and you can compute, of course, everything in that fixed point. It is a Gaussian fixed point. The mean field theory that I mentioned in the first transparency, the mean field theory is an example of a Gaussian fixed point. And uh, it, ha it gives you those exponents, those exponents that I showed there, which had some simple values like zero and half and one. Those are the exponents that you get if you were to view the a critical point as a Gaussian fixed point or a, uh, non uh, or a non-interacting field theory. What Wilson and Fisher realized was that the 3D Ising model is actually governed by not the Gaussian fixed point. Uh, it is give, uh, uh, not the free field fixed point, but an interacting conformal field theory. CFT is conformal field theory. An interacting conformal field theory in which the critical exponents are non-trivial. Uh, they are not those given by a free theory. Uh, and uh, this was a very important insight because people had been really trying to understand how, why is it that the mean field theory fails and so on. Uh, um, uh, the arguments of Landau and Ginsburg looked fairly uh, reasonable and very, um, uh, very kind of robust. Uh, so it was Wilson and uh, Wilson who realized that uh, the, uh, the quantum fluctuations or the statistical fluctuations uh, actually in the 3D Ising model are significant and then they are actually governed by the uh, uh, non-trivial Wilson Fisher fixed point. And, um, uh, and this was the first example, like I said, of an interacting uh, conformal field theory. Interacting because a Gaussian theory is in the language of quantum field theory, as I said, a free theory. So uh, there are no interactions in, if you were to think in terms of Feynman diagrams and so on, there's no interaction vertices, etc. cetera. Um, uh, but the Wilson Fisher fixed point is not like that. The weight uh, in the language of my previous slide, uh, the Boltzmann weight or the Feynman weight that you associate to uh, the different configurations in the path integral of the uh, partition function. Um, these weights are not Gaussian weights. They are non-Gaussian. Uh, Gaussians are the free theories uh, where things are quadratic in the fields. Um, but uh, the weights, the exponents uh, are non-Gaussian in some sense. So, uh, so the 3D Ising model has a special uh, a fixed name associated to it, and there's a generalization of this to the class that I described in the beginning, the one labeled by another integer n, a positive integer n, uh, n equal to one was the uh, Wilson uh, uh, Fisher fixed point, but you can have an O2, O3 versions of these, and more generally an ON version of this. Uh, Wilson Fisher fixed point, though I think experimentally probably you don't go beyond n equal to four or something like that. Uh, so, but in any case, uh, there are uh, uh, there's a whole family of such uh, non-trivial uh, um, interacting conformal field theories, which are given by this Wilson Fisher fixed point and its generalizations.
Uh, okay, so that has told you uh, that uh, I just sort of stated for you what these things are uh, really, but um, I'll, uh, I'll say a little bit more about them uh, later, but let me stop here if there are any questions. Um, Please ask questions to the speaker. Guys, please ask question if you have yeah. anything or otherwise. Yeah, you can ask me as we go along as well. Uh, so okay. let, me con uh, let me continue if there's no, no question immediately. So, so I mentioned this thing called CFTs or conformal field theories, which is what will be uh, playing a stellar role in uh, what follows. Um, so the question is, uh, uh, how do we try to understand the dynamics of these non-Gaussian conformal field theories? So the mean field theory or the free field theory, these Gaussian theories are easy to uh, understand because the path integral is quadrat, I mean, it is a Gaussian path integral, uh, the action is quadratic, and you can do the path integrals, you know how to compute all the correlators that are given in terms of the two-point function. Uh, but for a non-Gaussian distribution, uh, or a non-Gaussian weight, uh, it's more difficult to, uh, to, uh, to compute anything, and there are very few techniques, and this is why the study of interacting conformal field theories is very important, very difficult. Um, uh, so, uh, so these critical exponents which I had introduced, like this new and eta, uh, they are um, captured by uh, in the language of quantum field theory. You can think of them as uh, captured by anomalous, so-called anomalous dimensions of operators. Uh, and in particular, in which uh, uh, which you can extract from considering the two-point functions of different operators at these fixed points. So, I, in fact, I already told introduced one of the critical exponents, eta. In that way, I told you you look at say the density fluctuations uh, uh, in the um, uh, liquid vapor system, uh, and uh, the look at the two-point function of the density fluctuations and that uh, has a power law dependence. And uh, in uh, that eta uh, 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 that entered over there, remember that g of x went like one over mod x to the power d minus two plus eta. Uh, so that eta was capturing the scaling behavior of that two point function. And you call it that an anomalous dimension because it's as if the operators that you uh, were comp whose uh, dimensions you were computing now transform under scale transformations. Uh, they transform not according to their naive engineering dimension, but by what is called an anomalous dimension in the language of uh, quantum field theory. And this is once again because the quantum corrections in a quantum field theory. Uh, affect the way in which uh, the, uh, uh, um, the 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 scaling of the theory uh, in uh, as you change x to say uh, some multiple of x, uh, um, so it doesn't scale in the naive way uh, because of these anomalous dimensions. So you want to uh, uh, to compute uh, these anomalous dimensions. Uh, in which um, so what what do you I'm trying to lay out over here? What are the main things you would like to know when you say you want to understand the dynamics of non-Gaussian CFTs? What are the main things you need to know? Uh, you need to know these two-point functions because they capture these critical exponents nu and eta through the so-called anomalous dimensions. But there's also additional dynamical data in the so-called three-point functions, which uh, I've just written schematically over here uh, uh, as some operator O1 at position X1, O2 at X2, O3 at X3. Uh, other, there is data encoded in these three-point functions as well. Um, because actually, 
uh, at first sight, it might seem that, oh, there's a lot of information because this can be at any position, x1, x2, x3. But it actually was shown by Polyakov very long ago that the position dependence on, on x1, x2, and x3, when you have conformal invariance, not just scale invariance, when you have the full conformal invariance, the position dependence on, on x1, x2, x3 is essentially completely fixed in terms of the dimensions uh, of the op individual operators O1, O2, and O3. Uh, and every, so the, essentially the form of the three-point function is essentially fixed up to an overall number, which you can call C123. It's some kind of a three structure constant of uh, these three operators. Uh, so this is why it's often denoted as C123. Um, uh, and uh, so apart from that overall constant, uh, the position dependence is completely fixed in terms of the anomalous dimension. So, so if you know all the anomalous dimensions of all the operators, O1, O2, O3, uh, then your is uh, then uh, uh, and if you know the c one two three then the three point functions are completely fixed so conformal invariance severely constrains the form of all these uh, operators and uh, so on uh, and uh, and you would now like to uh, uh, and in fact you can actually show more that in some sense in principle, once you know these two-point function data and the three-point function data, uh, the C123, you actually know all the correlators in the theory. You can, in principle, compute all the correlators. If I know this data, the so-called conformal data uh, of anomalous dimensions for all operators, so not so in some sense, it's a lot of information. You have to know uh, all the operators that are uh, uh, there in your spectrum, um, uh, you need to know their dimensions and you need to know all the possible three-point function uh, coefficients, uh, or sometimes they are called the OPE coefficients, uh, something I'll come to in a moment. Uh, but the hope for solving for this, so this is what you would like to solve for in a conformal field theory. And the hope is that, uh, the hope always was and in, still is that uh, the, there are dynamical constraints which potentially fix all these um, uh, three-point functions and the two-point functions completely. Um, uh, uh, so, so let's see how that might uh, uh, be the case, but okay, yeah, actually, before I do that, let me uh, say a few words about string theory. Well, let me bring in string theory since so far everything that I've talked about is uh, quantum field theory and mostly uh, about quantum field theory as it existed in the 60s and uh, early 70s. Uh, and so, uh, and so where does uh, string theory come in? So of course, most many people outside string theory often perceive it as some kind of a theoretical fantasy, uh, uh, which has to do with quantum gravity and it maybe lives in 10 dimensions or 26 dimensions, something. But uh, it's probably for those who actually work in the area, see it differently. They see it actually as a very, in some ways, it goes beyond quantum field theory and in fact gives new insights into, has given new insights into quantum field theory, and moreover links it in unexpected ways to general relativity as well. Um, and uh, so this is a statement I often like to make that uh, people of course ask uh, what is the evidence for string theory and so on. Very valid, uh, but uh, people don't often realize that string theory does make predictions of a theoretical kind, which are very falsifiable predictions. In fact, it makes very non-obvious, very precise, meaning there are they are like a very uh, uh, there's no fudging there. It's they, uh, string theory makes very precise predictions for the behaviors of both quantum field theories and general relativity, uh, uh, which can be falsified by calculations, by calculations in either of these frameworks. Recall that uh, quantum field theory and general relativity are frameworks that uh, of 20th century physics which predate string theory. Uh, and at first sight have 
nothing to do with each other. Uh, they sort of often operate in very different domains and, uh, and so on. And in fact, the connection between quantum field theory and general relativity that modern string theory gives is, uh, is of a very non-intuitive, non-obvious kind at all, I think. No one had even had the slightest inkling that there would be such a connection, uh, uh, despite the fact that these two uh, frameworks have been extensively studied for nearly a hundred years. Um, and um, uh, so, uh, so here, in fact, we are in 2020, we have sort of, I think, quantum field theory is roughly 95 years old and uh, 95 to 90 to 95 years old and general relativity is um, about 105 years old. So these are uh, very well studied uh, uh, frameworks and, uh, and, uh, you, and you realize uh, almost 80 to 100 years after these have been developed that there are still things to learn about these two and the connection, there's a very non-obvious connection between these two. And this is what will play a role in, uh, in uh, what I have to say. It is some of these insights into quantum field theory uh, um, that you get, these new insights, that will help us to make some uh, uh, new headway into, uh, into the problems uh, of quantum field theory like the ones I mentioned about statistical physics or uh, so to say down to earth things like liquid vapor or uh, water vapor and uh, um, liquid water. So, uh, so most of this uh, has come about in the context of this proposal by Maldacena and maybe in this seminar series you have heard other speakers also talk about it. Uh, so I won't go into details into that. Uh, but uh, it's a very precise proposal which equates the dynamics of a large class of conformal field theories uh, to that of gravity or string theory in a particular space-time, in a particular solution of Einstein's equations, uh, um, which is the so-called anti-de-sitter space-time. Uh, um, anti-de-sitter space-time, let me remind you, is a kind of hyperbolic space-time. So you have in Lorentzian signature, the cross-sections are uh, hyperbolic uh, spaces like this Escher's uh, painting and uh, and there's a time vertical direction uh, in Euclidean signature they are essentially hyperbolic space times so this relation uh, of Maldacena tells you that you you can talk about a conformal field theory which is on the boundary of this uh, uh, antidecitor space-time, whether Euclidean or Lorentzian signature, it doesn't really matter for this uh, discussion. Uh, uh, so uh, there is a conformal field theory at the boundary which captures everything about the d plus one dimensional uh, antidecitor space-time. So a d-dimensional boundary conformal field theory uh, uh, captures information about uh, the dynamics of uh, uh, gravity in d plus one dimensions. And there's a very precise dictionary between boundary variables on the CFT uh, and bulk variables in the gravity theory. What will be important for us is uh, just to, I mean, no, I mean, just for you to translate some of the things I mentioned, we talked about anomalous dimensions, which were appearing in the two point function of conformal field theory correlators. Uh, uh, these anomalous dimensions have a nice um, description in the language of this uh, bulk uh, gravity theory in anti space spacetime. Uh, it is essentially the energies of various states, uh, the spectrum of uh, the Hamiltonian in the, uh, in the, uh, in the bulk, uh, uh, um, uh, bulk theory. And the three-point functions, uh, which I had just mentioned, O1, O2, O3, they correspond to just some kind of cubic interactions uh, of uh, the states in the bulk. Uh, and uh, you can translate questions like that of computing anomalous dimensions and three-point functions into questions in gravity or string theory. And in fact, it's a strong weak coupling duality, which actually tells you that uh, when the 
uh, when the conformal field theory is very far from being Gaussian. It's very highly interacting. That is when actually the gravity description in terms of Einstein's theory becomes more and more reliable. And there's a very definite dictionary again between uh, these variables. Uh, and there's a further kind of a caveat, which is that you, you had this parameter n that I talked about earlier in the context of this O.N. Wilson Fisher model, et cetera. Uh, if you take that parameter n very large, that actually means that the gravity in the bulk can be viewed as a classical theory uh, without even considering quantum gravity effects in the bulk. You don't even need to know about quantum gravity effects in the bulk if you're only looking at the so-called large n limit of the boundary CFT. Uh, and uh, this is often very Im important and useful because uh, the large n limit gives you a very good uh, uh, first approximation to understanding the boundary theory, the boundary CFT. In fact, uh, it, it, this large N approach is something that uh, people had been adopting in statistical physics and quantum field theory to understand, uh, get an analytic handle on uh, things like the Wilson Fisher fixed point, etc., uh, by looking at the ON theories at large N. And uh, they do a fairly good job in, in that. Uh, and uh, so, uh, so, the, uh, so the boundary theory can be a very highly interacting quantum field theory, uh, but somehow in the large end limit, that's captured by a classical gravity theory in the bulk. Uh, so that's uh, one of the remarkable things about this. So Rakesh, I have a question here. Sure. Uh, uh, the thing is, instead of holography, if we just think of uh, our real world, like if it is not a ds d plus one, if it is ds d plus one. So yes. can uh, anyone think about ds CFT correspondence type of thing where the cosmological constant is positive? Yeah, I mean, as you probably know, people have been trying to, uh, to, to make that a version of that precise. There seem to be uh, uh, some obstacles in doing that more, uh, uh, more completely. I mean, there are some things which people can probably, uh, which people say, which, uh, which people can compute using the symmetries uh, uh, because the conformal symmetries are there in the De Sitter space time as well. Um, uh, so there is some, some ways in which the symmetry is, um, uh, um, uh, plays a role in both. But if you want to go beyond the symmetries, there are, it's a little more difficult because the holography is more, the boundary of De Sitter space is sort of time, uh, is space-like, uh, so you have to go to the future in time or past time, and um, the question is, uh, uh, how do you capture dynamics in visitor space-time uh, through this holography if it is supposed to be in the far future? So when people have this idea of thinking of the wave function of the universe at this time slice um, and the future and that somehow capturing cap the wave function of the Dissiter space time has been captured. I don't know that much useful has come out of it because I think the dictionary is still very, um, I mean, and there, are, there are some conceptual kind no, of I ideas. Just, I, I, I can understand what you are pointing. I just have a, a little bit confusion that some people used to take uh, that uh, goes to ADS to DS by big rotating the time and yeah. Then, uh, yeah. yeah. So how that is like, is it like, it is, is, uh, I mean, it's a tricky thing to just be rotated blindly. I mean, I think you can't, uh, you can't, I think, uh, always hope to, uh, to get things, um, uh, uh, completely correct uh, that way because the, you have to do a double wick rotation in some sense. True. Uh, um, uh, so you have to change. So then, what is dynamics is becomes something else. Uh, uh, so um, yeah. So as I said, I don't think there's any good answer to your question yet. Uh, uh, but people have been trying, but it's sort of been a little challenging, I think, to uh, uh, to to get a good answer.
Okay, uh, thank you. So, um, so I want to uh, uh, to focus first on um, uh, something that uh, 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 first uh, go back to this Owen Wilson Fisher theory, which because I just mentioned how at large n people had been actually studying that in the context of um, uh, understanding the Wilson Fisher fixed point. Um, so it turns out, and it was realized in the early 2000s by these people that. Uh, there is a ADS4 dual. So this is a three-dimensional theory, like I mentioned, the Wilson-Fisher theory is a three-dimensional theory because it's describing these three-dimensional statistical physics models like uh, liquid vapor transition, etc. So there's a three-dimensional, a four-dimensional antidesitor dual to this, but the bulk theory is quite unusual. It is what is called a higher spin theory uh, or a Vasiliev theory, uh, because it uh, it's uh, uh, if you look at large n, the bulk theory is classical. Like I said, you don't need to worry about quantum effects, uh, which are proportional to one over n. Um, so in the leading order, you can describe it by a classical theory, and there's only a single tower of interacting higher spin fields. Uh, uh, unlike in string theory, where you have many higher spin fields, uh, here you actually, uh, the difference uh, here is that you have, uh, uh, you have many higher spin fields, but they are firstly gauge fields, so they are in some sense massless, uh, and uh, they, they are all interacting with each other. So you have, in addition to gravity, you have these spin, spin fields uh, in the simplest case, they have only the even spins. In this ON case, you have only the even spins, so two, four, six, eight, uh, so on. Uh, and and uh, Vasiliev, in fact, has given a rather involved but intricate um, uh, classical theory, um, uh, which um, uh, describes the interactions of these uh, uh, higher spin fields. And uh, and there is uh, uh, and people uh, realized you can reproduce many uh, known results of the large end theory in a completely novel way in this uh, 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 from this point of view. Uh, in fact, uh, there is even um, uh, when I when I first showed that transparency of Chaikin and Lubensky's uh, table. Uh, I had uh, it had not only three dimensional cases but also two dimensional cases uh, which uh, which are described by two dimensional CFTs uh, interacting CFTs and that uh, is in fact a simple you you can have a simpler analog of the Wilson Fisher theory in those cases and there is indeed a large n family of interacting two dimensional CFTs which has an ADS3 Vasiliev dual, and these uh, are a, a family of so-called Cosset CFTs. Uh, so those who have seen two-dimensional CFTs know that uh, the uh, uh, um, the two-dimensional Ising model belongs to a family of uh, uh, in fact, it can be viewed as a Cosset of a SU2 level one. Uh, times SU2 level one, uh, uh, sort of modded out by SU2 level two. Uh, that's what the 2D Ising model theory can be uh, viewed as. And there is in fact a whole family of them for n equal to two, but for as you vary k, you get different uh, statistical physics models like the POTS model and other models in a tricriticalizing model and so on in two dimensions and all that critical behavior is captured by these interacting two-dimensional CFTs um, and you can actually go on to generalize that class by having a general SUN coset model and uh, these have in fact higher spin conserved currents which are sort of dual to these higher spin gauge fields uh, and um, so the, uh, the, the statement uh, of uh, duality here was a relation between this family of interacting two-dimensional conformal field theories 
with uh, um, the duality to a bulk Vasiliev theory in ADS3, uh, which, uh, which has a similar higher spin uh, tower. Uh, and um, in the large n limit of this, the large n limit makes, uh, 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 makes perfect sense. So uh, Rajesh, I have one more uh, question. Sure. Uh, maybe it is very elementary, but I'm just asking that why this classical theory uh, for ADS can be thought of as a single tower of interacting higher spin, which is uh, greater than two, particularly? Uh, so in the ON theories, or these are these ON Wilson Fisher model, uh, or these um, similarly, these Cosette theories over here the number of degrees of freedom grows like n rather than n square for large n. Uh, mm -hmm. They are so-called vector-like models uh, mm -hmm. in the sense that their basic fields, uh, are, like in the O.N. Wilson-Fisher theory, you can think of the basic fields as an n-component scalar, uh, scalar theory uh, with n components and an O.N. global symmetry rotating those components. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, the uh, the basic operators in the theory, the analog of the gauge invariant operators, in fact, the simplest kind of gauge invariant operators are things where you have uh, just uh, phi i derivatives and phi i. They're made from bilinears of these fields. Uh, you, uh, the others are, can be viewed in some sense as all composites built from these basic bilinear theory. Unlike in a gauge theory, which is what the usual Maldacena correspondence, the CFTs are gauge theories at large n. And in the gauge theories, there are many more gauge invariant operators which correspond to single particle states. Uh, okay. uh, whereas in the Wilson-Fisher-like theories or these Cosette theories, uh, there are only a handful of, uh, there's only a single tower, in fact, uh, uh, of these sort of um, operators in the bulk, which correspond to particles in the, uh, in the operators in the boundary CFT, which correspond to particles in the bulk theory. Uh, and, uh, and, and the counting actually works in such a way that you just have a single tower for each uh, in fact, uh, for the Wilson Fisher, it's very easy to say they are essentially phi with some s derivatives, uh, phi. So essentially, that's the, uh, okay. the, uh, the so the those are the operators which correspond to the spin s field in the bulk, and okay. uh, and there's essentially only one for every spin. Uh, are a finite number of these operators for any spin. Um, whereas in a string theory, you have a exponentially growing uh, spectrum. So these are actually much simpler theories than string theories. Uh, in some ways, they are what is called the leading rigid trajectory of a string theory. It okay. has only one of the uh, yeah, uh, oscillators okay. excited. Thank you. So, um, um, yeah, uh, so the nice thing about these models, in particular the Cosette model, I just want to say a few words about, is the solvable quantum field theory. So this is a case where you can actually, it's not one where you're actually learning very much new about the quantum field theory, uh, though it does give you a new insight into how the quantum field theory is, uh, uh, is organized, but it's actually a case where both sides are solvable uh, and uh, in the large n limit, and you can actually make very explicit checks. Uh, so thus you can match the partition function and correlation functions uh, in appropriate limits. I uh, have some expressions. Um, uh, I just wanted to, uh, you don't need to uh, really uh, 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 follow all the expressions. Uh, this is a expression for a partition function. So Q and Q bar are sort of the generators of the, um, uh, the um, they correspond to chemical potentials, uh, uh, both temperature and uh, rotation in the, uh, in the uh, bulk theory or in the CFT. So you have 
uh, you can write the mm, in the bulk theory you can write the uh, at, uh, in the leading semi-classical approximation you can write down what the uh, what the contribution is uh, from all the higher spin fields that is the zhs so you have this this is the contribution for a given spin s which and s goes from 2 to infinity uh, and then there's also a scalar field and it gives you uh, the uh, particular contribution this h plus and h minus are some parameters uh, uh, q as i said is uh, some chemical potential and this is the generating function for the states of the vesiliev theory on ads3 uh, uh, and you can actually match this answer completely with this two-dimensional CFT, which at first sight looks very different. There's an explicit answer for the partition function on the CFT, oops, uh, which is given in terms of some characters uh, and uh, labeled by representations of SUN. The details, again, are not important, but if you actually take the large N so-called Toft limit, uh, and where you hold this parameter p, p is just n plus k, you hold that fixed, then the 2D CFT matches the, the, this answer in the large n limit, matches exactly the answer in the previous uh, transparency, which is a fairly non-trivial match uh, of this uh, partition function. So you can see in an explicit case uh, uh, how this holography really works it is uh, without any sort of uh, supersymmetry or any uh, so, some of the usual magic that uh, is usually there when you're matching bulk and the boundary uh, quantities that's not there and you can actually see the, uh, very clearly in your face how it works and this is an example of what i meant by non-trivial non-obvious predictions uh, which uh, uh, which uh, which happened to match. Uh, so the Vesilev theory was developed independent of string theory by Vesilev, Fradkin collaborators um, over many years. Uh, and, uh, it, and just the internal consistency from having all the gauge invariances of all these higher spin fields led them to uh, uh, a fairly tight, um, uh, tight um, uh, classical description of the theory uh, and uh, uh, it has exactly all the features uh, uh, that I mean you you compute there there's no you don't have any much freedom in computing the spectrum of states there that's what I showed in the previous slide similarly the two-dimensional CFTs were also solved using very different techniques uh, by Belevin, Polyakov, Zamolodchikov, and others uh, followed. Um, uh, and there also you get a very definite answer. There's no fine tuning or anything you need to do. You just uh, compare them in this large N limit, which is the regime where they're supposed to agree, and uh, you get a perfect match. Uh, so that's one of the mm, uh, remarkable things about uh, this duality. And so I was illustrating that in the context of this two-dimensional CFTs and the uh, analog of the O.N. Wilson Fisher fixed point in two dimensions. But let's come back to three dimensions. Uh, uh, yes. So uh, is there any understanding of the one over N corrections from the bulk? Or Not completely, because no one has really had a no one has really found an independent way to quantize the Vesilev theory uh, or even do a perturbative expansion in the Vesilev theory. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I think there are maybe some basic uh, things which are independent of the quantization. In, an, in some ways, what I said is goes one order beyond because um, uh, what I said is involves a one loop in the Vasiliev theory, which doesn't is not sensitive. One loop you can always do in any theory because uh, you just have to uh, include all the tree level quantities, uh, the spectrum. So one loop doesn't really see the quantum interaction. So, so you can do to one loop, but to higher loops, I don't know. Uh, I don't think anyone has done a very convincing calculation. But in principle, there is, that is a target that you can try to do that and 
and it match it with uh, what the conformal field theory tells you. The conformal field theory, there's a, there are definite answers because you know the theory for any finite n and k, uh, so you can actually uh, expand it in a one over n expansion and try to compare it with the bulk theory. And that would be a good way to see whether if you have a proposal for how to get one over n corrections in the bulk, this, uh, this is one way to check whether it's consistent. I see, and, and even the stringy constructions don't help. Uh... So there is no real, uh, at least for the uh, ones that I'm considering, the Cosette CFTs in two dimensions, there's no real uh, string embedding. And people have not really embedded it in a string theory fully. Uh, so, um, uh, so it's not, uh, that's another interesting question and open problem uh, of whether you can view the Vasiliev theory and this uh, CFT as arising from some limit of a string construction, uh, from a stringy construction so that the whole, both sides are kind of embedded inside a string theory. And uh, it may be possible, I mean, I don't know. It's a little challenging because these are non-supersymmetric theories, uh, but you can maybe embed them as some sector in some bigger non-supersymmetric sector in some bigger supersymmetric theory, et cetera, but uh, it hasn't been done. Thanks. Okay, uh, uh, so, uh, so let me go back to the Wilson Fisher fixed point and say that if you want to study the three dimensional Ising model, which is in a sense the n equal to one case, then of course the large n limit is far from being adequate for studying this CFT. And you want perhaps uh, other ways of trying to address it. And in fact, Wilson and Fisher, like I mentioned at the beginning, um, uh, uh, they adopted a sort of a very um, clever approach to try to uh, uh, compute things in this uh, um, uh, in this uh, CFT by realizing that you could uh, uh, the um, the n equal to one case is actually just um, for those of you who know it's just a single scalar field um, uh, the O n case was an n component scalar field, so the n equal one case is just a single scalar field, but with a quartic interaction. Uh, and uh, you you are looking at the three dimensional case where the quartic coupling is actually the quartic interaction is actually a relevant coupling. So the three D Ising model can be viewed in the continuum limit where you are looking at the Wilson Fisher fixed point as really a phi to the fourth field theory uh, in three dimensions uh, at its critical point. So to get a handle on this critical point, which is not the free theory, but where the quartic coupling is important, uh, what they realized is that you can pretend to be in a, uh, look at this phi to the fourth theory in uh, arbitrary dimension D and expand around four dimensions. So in four dimensions, it's known that actually there's only the Gaussian fixed point. Uh, and you can pretend that you are a little below four dimensions. So you take D, the dimensions to be four minus epsilon, you expand in epsilon. Uh, and then uh, when epsilon is small, so you pretend, and in quantum field theory, in fact, most of the Feynman diagram expansions that you do are given in terms of integrals that have, uh, that you can write down for arbitrary D. So, uh, so this is what Wilson and Fisher did. They, uh, they realized that for small epsilon, the non-trivial fixed point is actually very close to the Gaussian fixed point. So the quartic coupling has a value which is proportional to epsilon uh, when, uh, when epsilon is small. Um, so you can treat it in perturbation theory and treat all the Feynman integral, uh, treat all the corrections to your uh, correlation functions uh, through Feynman diagrams and Feynman integrals. Uh, and uh, these can be defined for general D and you can make an epsilon expansion of these around D equal to four. So this is what they did. 
and, uh, and so uh, they computed the anomalous dimensions uh, to low orders in epsilon for the in fact in general for the on theory they could do it and i'm uh, since i mentioned these exponents nu and eta at the beginning uh, i'm showing you the expressions they had for uh, nu and eta uh, for any fix for any fixed n so you can take n equal to one in this uh, also uh, and you have here they have uh, i've shown things up to order epsilon square and for this one up to order epsilon cubed and uh, actually if you put in the value epsilon equal to one so they were hoping that maybe it you can get away with somehow get away with um, uh, um, uh, putting epsilon equal to one at the end, uh, even though you're pretending epsilon is small, but uh, you can actually uh, uh, try to see whether these expressions maybe make sense for epsilon equal to one. And they do reasonably well. If you actually put in epsilon equals to one here, you can see the successive terms are in some sense somewhat more suppressed and um, and um, and you get a reasonable estimate even for epsilon equal to one and uh, in to some extent these were some of the initial things that made one confident that the critical exponents that were being observed in expon in experiment um, uh, matched with the ideas of Wilson. Um, so this Wilson-Fisher computations were very influential because of that, because they really told you how you can try to uh, compute uh, things even to um, uh, even when you, uh, uh, when you can't do an exact computation, this epsilon expansion gives you a, uh, gives you a, a reasonably a successful uh, scheme for approximating it and people improved on these approximation schemes they did better ways to approximate it and make it series more uh, slightly better behaved um, but um, uh, yeah so this is how i think the analytic results uh, some of the first analytic results uh, were obtained so um, but around the same time, there was this other idea that um, you could uh, call the conformal bootstrap, which was as an alternative to doing these Feynman diagram computations. And uh, which uh, in some ways, uh, if one could make it work, would be applicable even when perturbation theory isn't. Uh, and it uses the fact that you can look at a four point function in a conformal field theory. So, so far I talked about two point functions and three point functions, but you can look at a four point function in a conformal field theory in two different ways in this sort of, uh, you can think of it in a, in a OPE channel where you bring the operators one and two together, the operators three and four together, and then you get a sum over contributions uh, labeled by um, a single operator in the uh, so-called S channel, uh, or you could think of uh, taking operators one and four together and two and three together and write uh, the correlator as a sum over exchanges in this T channel of other operators O. And there is a regime of the, uh, of the positions X1, X2, X3, X4, where, where there's a simultaneous both these expansions so you can uh, you can equate these two and that actually gives you in principle a lot of constraints on the conformal data in the theory so recall that the conformal data uh, are the ones contained in the two-point functions these dimensions and in three-point functions and this is what you have written a four-point function by expanding in this operator product expansion of bringing say O1, O2, you write it as a sum over operators O. Um, what you have done is uh, uh, re re rewritten the correlator in terms of products of three point functions of one, two, and O, three, four, and O, and, uh, and with their uh, uh, together, and you also need the two point functions which carry their information on the dimensions of the operator. You have a complicated nonlinear equation involving 
these structure constants 1, 2, O, oh, 3, 4, O oh, with 1, 4, O oh, and 2, 3, O oh, in this particular case. Uh, I have probably written that uh, later. Um, so you get an infinite set of constraints and you might hope that uh, you can use that to solve this theory because they are very nonlinear constraints. If you uh, haven't seen these before, maybe one close analog of these is the sort of Jacobi identity that was that is there in Lie algebras and which was in fact used to classify all Lie algebras. So you use the fact that um, you can write it once again a sort of a, a, a commutator in uh, to in uh, uh, in as the uh, product of uh, uh, the um, uh, uh, um, uh, the two point functions uh, in terms of a three point function or f i j k the structure constants um, and you got quadratic constraints for the structure constants through the Jacobi identity. This is some sense a bit like that in that spirit. And in that case, those constraints were very powerful to enable you to classify all the possible Lie algebras, uh, at least the semi-simple Lie algebras and so on. And so this was part of the Cartan classification uh, of uh, uh, semi-simple Lie algebras. So the hope was, this is some much more complex version of it, and perhaps you can try to uh, uh, to solve for uh, these uh, 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 structure constants that way. And in fact, um, so this was an idea that was uh, proposed in the 60s, 70s, but not uh, much progress had come, except in two dimensions, which were Belevin, Polyakov, and Zamlochikov were uh, able to exploit this to solve for uh, the two-dimensional theories like those Cosette models, etc., that I mentioned. Uh, in, uh, but an important breakthrough came a few years ago when um, these constraints were implemented numerically by a very clever truncation and which enabled you want to derive inequalities that would be obeyed by uh, the dimensions and also the four point, uh, three point functions. Uh, the set of equations could be rewritten in a very nice way, uh, which uh, then you could actually look uh, for a numerical uh, uh, solutions, obeying these inequalities. And in the best cases, actually, those inequalities were very tight and narrowed uh, things around, uh, narrowed things down to uh, pinpoint things fairly accurately. And in fact, the current best numerical values for critical exponents in the 3D Ising model and etc. are not given by uh, numerical simulations, but by this so-called numerical bootstrap uh, technique that uh, these folks and people after them uh, uh, implemented. So uh, I want to just in the last few minutes say a little bit about an approach that is, uh, I have been uh, uh, um, uh, studying a bit uh, in collaboration with Aninda Sinha, I think, who has probably also spoken in this, uh, this thing. He might have said a little bit about uh, some of this. So anyway, I won't take much time on that. Uh, it's something with Aninda and then uh, uh, some of his students earlier. Um, uh, so this was is inspired by the ADS CFT in which we uh, think, even though it's not perturbative, we write in term perturbative uh, uh, language in antidecitor space time uh, in terms of the so-called Feynman diagrams in antidecitor space, which are these sort of uh, written diagrams, what are called the written diagrams. And you, you can try to rewrite uh, the four-point function as a sum of these contributions in uh, of these different written diagrams and demand cancellations of uh, when you... Uh, so here, what you do is sort of, you build in the fact that this thing is symmetric under x1, x2, x3, x4, uh, but then when you choose to expand it in this way, then you have to... Uh, then many spurious powers of positions arise and you have to demand that these get cancelled. Um, and it's more efficient to translate it to an analog of momentum space uh, via something called a Mellin transform, 
and these amplitudes have very nice mor meromorphic properties and uh, so the condition of these cancellations becomes conditions of some uh, spurious poles getting cancelled. And uh, in some ways, it appears to be very effective, um, uh, though we have to try to understand better when and how it works. Uh, it, certainly, it reproduces many of the things in the epsilon expansion very well. In fact, you get some of the results I showed earlier for the epsilon expansion, but you can also go beyond and compute three-point functions, which are normally very prohibitive to do even in the epsilon expansion. Uh, for instance, a three-point function of the basic energy, uh, basic um, density variables, uh, these phi's with the energy momentum tensor, this uh, quantity, uh, I just want to show you as an example how one could compute a new quantity in using the uh, using these techniques. And this, in fact, at epsilon equal to one, it, this is the red line. Which uh, uh, so these numerical dots are from the uh, these dots are from the numerical bootstrap. Uh, and uh, this was the previous epsilon expansion, keeping only the order epsilon squared term. Uh, but with the epsilon cube term, you're sort of even closer at epsilon equal to one. So uh, you, you get it to about, I think, a couple of percent accuracy. So in some ways, I try to joke that string theory methods can help in studying the properties of water. So this is sort of what I meant by down to earth. Uh, and uh, so the, the epsilon expansion, uh, as I said, you can reproduce many of the results. I just want, don't want to go into that. These are the top line are various anomalous dimensions uh, of various operators. These are some three-point functions. There are more three-point functions of higher spin operators, which, uh, which are very complex expressions. But just to give you a sense of how you can reproduce many of them in a fairly simple way using this sort of ADS inspired language. So let me just sum up by saying uh, the framework of string theory is very powerful. Uh, in some ways it sheds very new and unexpected light on quantum field theory and gravity. And a large part of this has been driven by this very unusual anti-desitter formulation dual formulation of CFTs. And as I said, CFTs are ubiquitous in quantum field theories. And um, therefore, this is why ADS-CFT correspondence is something very central uh, to modern understanding of quantum field theories. And it can lead to down-to-earth consequences because CFTs have very down-to-earth applications. And uh, this conceptually, the ADS-CFT correspondence and some of these things that I mentioned, I think needs further unraveling. Uh, and I think in particular, one of my main goals ha has been to understand the underlying mechanism of this ADS-CFT duality, the nuts and bolts. So I hope this is something we'll be able to, uh, to figure out. I just wanted to close by a, a passage from Richard Feynman, which is there in his Feynman lectures, which I, someone, I found an illustration by someone. So he says the whole universe in a glass of wine. So this is the quote from the Feynman lectures. A poet once said the whole universe is in a glass of wine. We will never know in what sense he meant that for poets don't write to be understood. But it is true that if you look at a glass of wine closely enough, you will see the entire universe. So in that sense, something down to earth like a liquid vapor, uh, what you would see in a glass of wine, uh, I can tell you so much about uh, uh, has in some sense encoded in it uh, uh, the entire universe, or at least the anti desitter universe. Uh, okay, uh, thank you very much, and uh, happy to take any more questions. So thank you for uh, giving such a elaborative and uh, nice talk. And uh, uh, you guys, please ask question. Now this is an interacting session. And uh, before doing that, uh, like it is better if it is, uh, you just uh, put your hands up, then I can, uh, because if there are many questions, that is the only possibility to do. Otherwise, uh, please unmute yourself and give a clap for him for giving such a nice talk.
I don't know whether people are there or not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, it's Guys, you don't have any questions. It, it, it's been, I think. Uh, I have. Uh, uh, Onurag, please ask. Yeah, a very naive question. Sir, why do we need infinite uh, uh, constants on the dimensions? No, what do you mean? You talked, in, infinite you talked about. Yeah, like you talked about that, not that we need constants on dimensions. So why do we need actually uh, const infinite uh, sets of constants on dimensions? Uh, uh, constraints, you mean? Uh, uh, oops. How yeah. Do I work? Yeah. Uh, no, this is. This is what you mean uh, about the infinite set of constraints. Yeah. Yes. Sir. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so I meant constraints uh, because these are equations which will relate the three-point functions uh, of one, two, o, three, four, o, etc. Uh, so they are quadratic relations because you'll have a product of two three-point functions here, product of two three-point functions here. So the structure constants will appear quadratically. The dimensions will, uh, so that's the three-point functions. The dimensions, the anomalous dimensions, uh, delta one, delta two, delta O, delta three, delta four, etc., cetera, will, uh, will appear in more complicated ways because you will, these will appear in actually in multiple ways uh, in, from the uh, three, uh, from the two-point functions, etc., of these uh, intermediate fields. Uh, and um, uh, so you get a very uh, complex set of relations and you get an infinite set of constraints because this has to be true for any values of x1, x2, x3, x4. And so if you decompose it in appropriate partial waves and so on, uh, even for a fixed uh, external set of operators, you will get uh, an infinite set of relations between these constants. Uh, remember, in the end, we are trying to solve uh, solving uh, the conformal field theory means solving for these three-point function, the constants, those C, one, two, three, like I wrote earlier, and these dimensions with anomalous dimensions, which are also some numbers. So you are trying to solve for these constants, and you have, if you have an inf infinite number of equations, and there are infinite number of unknowns, you would like to make sure that you have the right set of infinite set of equations and unknowns that, and you might hope to be able to solve it. Uh, uh, but it's very complicated because it is a system of an infinite number of equations for an infinite number of unknowns. And you have to be clever to be able to solve it in some tractable way. Um, of course, in fact, if you vary the external operators and introduce all possible operators, then you will get many more constraints. Some of them may be independent, some of them may be dependent. Uh, and so you have to, uh, you have to uh, judiciously choose this. But uh, the main point is that you get an infinite set of equations. That's what I meant by this. Okay, sir. Thank you. Sir. Uh, hello, uh, Rajesh. Is, is it possible to uh, uh, explain in a few words how uh, these can is demanding this cancellation of poles give these equations uh, is instead of bounds uh, yeah because now these are equations because you want to say that uh, so there are spurious poles uh, when you write in terms of these uh, written diagrams uh, you get uh, in this exchange over here, you get so-called double trace operators also that can be exchanged. Mm -hmm. And in general, in a CFT, you don't have, uh, other than in a large end CFT, the dimensions of the double trace operators are not uh, multiples of the single trace operators. Uh, mm -hmm. And so there are spurious double trace operators over here uh, whose dimensions uh, correspond. That's what I meant by spurious powers of the position. Uh, and uh, you want to make sure that those coefficients, uh, th those, uh, those uh, expressions, and those spurious powers don't appear. And if by translating it into this Mellin transform, the powers become poles, 
the powers and position space become poles in melon space. And now you want to, the condition becomes that the residue of those poles must actually vanish. So in fact, it turns out you have double poles and single poles, and you have to ensure that the residues of both these double poles and single poles vanish. And uh, so those are equations. They are, uh, and in the best cases, like in the epsilon expansion to the orders we work, uh, yeah. you get actually a finite set of equ equations for a finite set of variables, uh, these uh, different anomalous dimensions. And that's what enables one to sort of get. Uh, does, it, uh, does it give an equation also for this kink, uh, like? Uh, no, 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 it, that, is, uh, that is in the numerical bootstrap. That's <laughs> a very different approach because right. there they are looking at inequalities. Here we are not looking at inequalities at all. That is right, but uh, wherever we have a kink, we have kind of say saturation of the inequality. Yes. So, uh, does means does these equations help uh, to shed any light? No, like, uh, not that I know, and at least not directly. At least not that I know of in any direct way, because uh, ours give just the expressions for those uh, uh, answers, but. Uh, yeah, the, the, the fact that they have a kink and so on is related to their scheme. Most yes. of uh, most of the uh, region that they have is an unphysical region anyway, uh, because you're choosing to look at certain equations, you will have uh, um, uh, you you will get uh, 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 because you're choosing to look at certain equations, you will get. Um, uh, uh, these kinks or these polygonal regions, but uh, uh, most of it is anyway unphysical, whereas mm. we are uh, trying to zoom in on the, uh, the, uh, the relevant uh, uh, and the directly the operators. But, uh, Can I ask something? Uh, so about competition of various methods. So I think anomalous dimensions of higher spin currents are known up to four loops for any n, and within larger expansion, they are known up to next to the leading order, which is five loops. So can you get more than that within both approaches? I mean, epsilon and one over n? Thank you. Yeah, uh, no, not yet. Uh, uh, so this is something we have been trying, but I don't think we have yet a good way to go beyond um, the uh, I mean at, at go up to the levels that you mentioned uh, the uh, uh, there seem to be many complications in doing that because in principle in this uh, Witten diagram expansion there could be also the so-called contact terms uh, and you need to uh, be able to find a good way in which you pin down these contact terms, they seem to appear at these next orders in epsilon. And moreover, you get, uh, 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 yeah, you seem to get infinite towers of operators coming in at the same time uh, when you go to the next order and how to disentangle them and fix these uh, contact terms. This is a problem which we haven't yet managed to, uh, uh, to solve. So this is something I think uh, an open question, and uh, uh, we, in a sense, got very lucky uh, so far uh, that to, uh, to at least to some very good order in epsilon, uh, the things were relatively simple. But to go beyond that and implement uh, this approach, I think we'll need insights. Okay, many thanks. So I think there is, uh, your colleague is there. So, sir, can you please uh, unmute yourself? Uh, Sudhakar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I guess he, he is, uh, he's probably tied up, but uh, yeah. Okay, so uh, other people don't have any question? Yeah, I think it's already almost two hours, I think. <laughs> so it's people are right now very uh, tired. So yeah. anyways, uh, it is really nice uh, 
uh, overview. I am very sure that it will be helpful when I will be posted in YouTube for others. And uh, most importantly, stay safe and yeah. Uh, like, yeah, be healthy and hopefully things will be better soon and sometime we can meet in person rather than <laughs> virtually. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, yeah. Uh, good luck to everyone. And uh, like uh, Santan said, stay safe and uh, uh, mm, see you all at some time or the other uh, when things get better. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye.